2010's our fourth annual. And we began with Lee Swing Sing, Mao's Last Dancer. And our second year was Josephine, in combination with Doug Elix. And last year, it was Andrew Lewis, the Chairman and President and CEO of Dow. And this year, we've got a lovely combination, very complimentary combination of Bruce and Amelia. Tomorrow is Australia Day. I wish you all, my fellow citizens, a happy Australia Day tomorrow. But my path to Cold Spring Harbour was really grounded in the great education that I received in Australia. I was the first in my family to go to university. And I did so on an Australian Commonwealth University scholarship, without which I probably would not have gone to university. The Australian education system accommodated my early interest in science and medicine while still exposing me to broad knowledge outside of those areas, including history, which happened to be my favorite subject and still is. The education system in the schools challenged me, but allowed me the freedom of choice and freedom of inquiry. It's also a system that we should cherish and nurture because I think this system is the future of uh, Australia. In many ways, Australian science pulls far beyond its per capita weight, but it could do a lot better. Australia spends only 1.7% of GDP, which is about the same as Britain now. But compared to 27 in the United States and 3.3% in Sweden, which has a half the population of Australia. Unlike Britain, which is undergoing an economic austerity program at the moment and is cutting back, Australian budget has been buoyed by the massive uh, ore deposits and the export of raw materials mainly and to China. We should invest it, I think, in research and development. This increased funding should be accompanied by a strategic move to create innovation centres that surround some of the research intensive universities in Australia with the sole purpose to mix research and development uh, in different fields, making connections between these fields. The research in these innovation centres should involve academia, but particularly bringing into these centres uh, employees from industry who could work with students and, uh, and, and professors together across uh, different fields. Startup companies will emerge from these and these combined efforts. So Australia could have an incredibly bright future, contributing to major advances in producing sustainable energy resources, producing food in increasingly difficult uh, in, uh, environments of growing food, and in making advances in, in, uh, in human and animal health. So what I'd like to end with and suggest is that on this Australia Day, and in fact it is Australia Day, in, uh, Australia now. <laughs> we recognize that uh, what is really great about Australia, which has often been called the lucky country, but I hope Australia in the future is called the innovation country. So happy Australia Day. Thank you. But well, while getting to Australia isn't the easiest thing in the world, that's actually precisely the journey that I want to focus on today. I want to posit that Australia's distance is not a pitfall, or at least not exclusively a pitfall, um, but also a unique privilege, and that our country's unique interplay of history and geography, our status as this pristine island at the end of the world, is in itself a rather profound privilege of Australian citizenship. Every Australian originally came from somewhere else, and it's in fact this sense of distance or even displacement that I think has imbued the Australian character with a quite unique set of traits, um, which I've only really come to realize and appreciate in the 12 years that I've spent I away from it. I want to posit that to be an Australian today means to possess an identity that's inherently elastic, that's defined by a sense of possibility, adventure, even daring. And I say this simply because anyone who decided to make that journey in the first place, to start a new life in a country that was that from which you can see no other country has to be pretty determined to but do so. But we come so. from a nation of risk takers, built by those who were drawn to the land at the end of the world. Our history explains why so many Australians remain so outward looking. It's why there are, in fact, so many expats. Australians have never felt like where they grew up was all there was. They could never think that. We've never assumed that the Australian way was always the right way. The attitude is instead, why not see how they do things elsewhere? 
It's why successive generations of young Australians have felt brave enough to make the leap in reverse and experience the world for themselves, often for very long periods. Interestingly, this has remained true even as the country's economic standing over the past two decades has moved it from a peripheral to a central place in world affairs. It's not just the sheer size of the United States which produces this difference. It's also that we are a young country, even younger than the one we're in right now, and we're almost entirely unencumbered by tradition. And in our manners, I believe we are as democratic and as republican as they come. I suppose it has both its positive and negative implications, but the reason why Australians travel so widely and with such hunger has to do with the flexibility of our national ties. You meet an Australian everywhere you go. I'm certainly dismayed that the novelty of being an Australian in New York is not what it once was. We cross the world now in the back of 747s because of the bold journeys on which our families embarked. We understand that our nation is shaped not by fate or by divine providence, but by our own actions and decisions. Australia is a story that is still being told, and I can directly link my own experience overseas to that sense of possibility and promise. I hope we never lose it.